الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome you here again in our series The End Series In the past few classes we did speak about the person who is in the lowest place in heaven the last person to enter paradise but today inshallah we'll speak about the people who actually enter it that do not go to hellfire and the first among them who will enter it insha'Allah and it applies for the rest of the people who enter Jannah in relation to the mothers I mentioned a an authentic hadith last week you will find this hadith it's authenticated by Al-Albani rahmatullahi alayh it's also narrated by Tirmidhi and this hadith is about a man by the name of Muawiyah not the Muawiyah that we always hear of that was the Khalifa, another man by the name of Muawiyah, who came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I wish to go with you on jihad in the cause of Allah, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rasul ﷺ said to him, Woe to you, do you have a mother? So he approached him from the left side and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I seek to go with you on jihad fi sabilillah, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him again, Do you have a mother? So I approached him a third time and repeated my question. He repeated the same response and I approached him fourth time and he repeated the same response. I wanted the pleasure of Allah by going to jihad fi sabilillah. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to me, he said, do you have a mother? I said, yes. He said, serve her and you will find paradise. The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provision of paradise. In another hadith, serve her feet, you will find paradise. So the mothers are a walking paradise, if you like, metaphorically speaking. But obviously there are conditions. The mother has to be righteous. One who is obedient to her Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one who is righteous she can never be inferior and she must never accept for anyone anyone's accusations of her being inferior if she is righteous and obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala she is superior I mean just as a personal observation as I was growing up and now I'm past 30 looking at my mother when I go to visit, or um, it's a very regular basis, alhamdulillah, but I always watch her. Either she's making food for us, tending to guests, uh, ironing some clothes, washing some clothes, cleaning the home, preparing for the family and her children. I swear, probably, I'd say 90% of her day, seven days a week, she's doing that. And I say to myself, wow, here is a woman, and I'm sure all of you have mothers like that. Here is a woman who inshallah is righteous to Allah. I ask Allah to make her righteous and to place her in Jannah. That if at any moment the angel of death were to take her life, in what state will she die in? Most likely. Compared to us, what do we do? She will be dying, serving other people, benefiting others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And truly here, the hadith come, came to my head. You know, the meaning of the hadith, it's not exactly how it's stated, but the meaning of the hadith that we gather is that paradise is at their feet. I thought the closest thing I can get to paradise is to serve my mother as well. So it's something I wanted to share with you in relation to the mothers. In a modern time that we live in, this duty of the mother has been defamed. The duty of the mother has been looked at as something inferior. So the mother is the greatest asset to our society. And she makes up the generation to come. I have another example of the women of paradise. There, is, there was a man by the name of Julaybib who existed at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Julaybib. Even by hearing the name, you would think to yourself, what kind of a name is that? Why? This man, in fact, subhanAllah, it happened to be that he wasn't attractive in the eyes of many people. He wasn't a handsome man. 
his stature wasn't handsome, his face wasn't handsome, he wasn't one of those that you would call tall. And in fact, he was so unattractive to many people that one man who did, you know, said it and didn't fear Allah in saying it, he said, if I were to see him one more time, because I find him so unattractive, if I see his face one more time, I'm going to beat him. I'm going to beat him up. Just because he doesn't like looking at him. This man, Julaibib radiallahu anhu, was beautiful at heart and iman. And he never, no family would give him their daughter in marriage. No woman would accept him. And he had grown a little bit, you know, now getting to his middle age. And he complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up in his service. And he went to a family he knew of. And he asked them, they welcomed him and they said, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is here? He said, yes, I have come to seek your daughter's hand. And now he said, wow, this is the greatest honor that has ever occurred to us in the history in the history of our family. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeking the hand of our daughter. Obviously they got it wrong. He said, it's not for me. They said, who is it for then? Now keeping in mind their daughter was inside, she wasn't outside. He was speaking to the father and Allah and maybe the mother was there. And he said, it is for Julaibib. At that point, the father didn't know what to respond, except to say, Ya Rasulullah, you know, wallahi, you know, it's, it's a complicated situation, anyone but Julaibib. You know. So he basically said no. Our Rasul Sallallahu stood up, because that's the nature of the man with honor, stood up, would not repeat his question and plea to them. He walked away, said they have the right to say no. Now their daughter was inside and overheard a little bit of the conversation. She came out and she asked her parents, what did the Prophet ﷺ come for? They told her, Wallah, he came to seek your hand in marriage for Julaibib. And she was extremely shocked. What did her iman make her say? She said, Ar Rasul Sallallahu in himself was here to seek my hand in marriage. It doesn't matter who it was for. He was here seeking my hand for someone. And you refused him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi, I will accept no one but Julaibib. And so she put her parents in that position and she was given to Julaibib in marriage. The night of her marriage, before they actually consummated it, Julaibib had not consummated the marriage yet. Just the contract was done consummated the marriage, as in he did not have intercourse with her. They had just done the contract. Don't ask questions, yeah, like that. <laughs> you can ask those questions, I'm just joking with you. So, the consummated the marriage, the call to jihad was made. So he went to jihad. And Julaibib fought, and after the battle, Rasul Sallallahu went around looking for Julaibib. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, he asked who has martyred, who has been killed in this war? They said, so and so. so and, and he would ask, where is Julaibib? But nobody would know where he was. In fact, nobody really asked about him because he wasn't an important person. Hardly anyone knew him. Everyone's talking about giving names. The Rasul is asking, where is my Julaibib? Mine. He is mine. He searched for him and found him amidst the martyred ones. He had been killed. And Rasul Sallallahu grabbed his head, brought it close to him, and he said, Julaibib is mine. He is of me, and I am of him. And he, he told us about him being in paradise with his Hur Ain, his wives in paradise. But Julaibib is not the point here. The point here is the woman, Al Ansariya. She was from the Ansar tribe whom her name, her name is not known to us. But this extraordinary response for the love of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the love of Allah, the love of Jannah, this is what the woman did. And this is an example to all of us. The beauty is the beauty of Iman for a Muslim. And how many handsome men with extraordinary bodies and so on and so forth as the common 21st century puts it to the women today have gotten married and divorced with only a couple of months with only a year or two how many of them and the wife wishes that she had never seen him and she finds him repulsive when every other woman may find him gorgeous 
women, this has happened to them many before. And how many men who are not very attractive, and even women, vice versa, they get married, and you find them that they see them the most beautiful thing that ever happened to them. It is their nature and their treatment which beautified them. And Islam is the best beautification, for it is the religion and the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created the man and the woman and knows best what kind of guidance would attract them both to each other and make them live happy lives. There is one more. Those who raise daughters in righteousness and look after them will also enter paradise. Daughters. This is because, especially in the Arab world, sons are those who carry and inherit their father's names and their family. And they are, as they say, the backbone of the family. And because they have the authority and the power, the woman or the girl is looked at as the secondary part of the household. For this reason, Islam put extra emphasis on girls being the fruit of the hereafter, rather than the biggest fruit of this life. Since we already see the sons in many cultures and nationalities, the sons are something that a little bit favored in many cultures and nationalities. Ar Rasul Sallallahu told us that it was reported that Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother, Ummul Mu'mineen, mother of the believers, may Allah be pleased with her, said, a woman with two young daughters came to me asking for something to eat. I had nothing then to give her but one date. It doesn't mention if this woman who came to her was married or not. Allahu alam, these children were orphans. But the point is this woman came with two daughters of hers to Aisha radiallahu anha. And Aisha radiallahu had only two dates. She said, I gave these two dates to the woman and she took the dates and divided it between her daughters. She divided the date and divided between her daughters leaving nothing to herself. Then she stood up and left. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, I told him about this. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A person whom Allah tests with giving him daughters or her, and he treats them kindly and brings them up well, they will be a shield for him or her against the fire. This is narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. According to another version of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah Almighty, Almighty will admit this woman in paradise. He's talking about the woman. He said, Allah Almighty will admit this woman in paradise or will keep her away from the fire. You also find this in Riyadh al-Salihin. So here is another woman of an example raising these daughters, subhanAllah, in a time where daughters were looked at as a taboo, almost like a taboo. And they used to bury them before Islam alive. And till today even, you'll find many nationalities and cultures. You'll find that the daughter is not something very favored as the first child or. So they would look at the sons, as you all know. And Islam came to bring this in relation to daughters, but you'll not find the same narration about the sons being a shield on the day of judgment. Rather, the sons are more of an obligation. Even though the daughters are an obligation, uh, the sons have a different test and trial to us. I bring you now to a next topic. In this, in this great long series. The question is, will all Muslims enter paradise? Will all Muslims enter paradise? I was asked this question several times. And here I have a hadith about Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, who reported, I came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was wearing white clothes and sleeping. He used to love white clothing because white clothing could easily see any mark on them. Rasul liked to be clean, so white clothing was one of his favored colors. I went back to him again after he had got up from his sleep. And he said, Rasul said, Nobody says, La ilaha illallah. Nobody says, None has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And then later on he dies while believing in that except that he will enter paradise. I said, even if he had committed illegal sexual intercourse and theft, he said, even if he had committed illegal sexual intercourse and theft. I said, even if he had committed illegal sexual intercourse and theft, again, he said, even if he had committed illegal sexual intercourse and theft, in spite of Abu Dhar's disliking it, meaning he didn't like that people take this for granted and take it away in thinking that you can do this and still enter paradise. Rather, people did not understand this. Abu Abdullah says, 
said, narrator, this is at the time of death or before it, if one repents and regrets and says, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. He will be forgiven his sins. This is a person who says, la ilaha illallah, believing in it, but then repents from their sins. So the understanding of this hadith is not that you can go off and do all these acts of major sins, and just because you say, la ilaha illallah, you're going to enter paradise with it? No. It means that those who repent from it before their death, and they say the word la ilaha illallah, still believing it without making partners with Allah, it'll be, all the sins will be forgiven if they truly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَن يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah will never forgive that a partner should be made, ascribed unto him. But he will forgive all other things except whom he wills not to. On the day of judgment, if a person has committed partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they may, with the will of Allah, at the discretion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may be forgiven for all major sins, so long as you haven't committed shirk. This does not mean that they will be entering paradise straight away. Some of them will be punished. Some of them will enter hellfire in accordance with the sins which they have done. We've discussed this in many classes before. And this word, la ilaha illallah, obviously has conditions. For another hadith, the Sahabi says, Ya Rasulullah, should I inform people this? And he said, don't. فَيَتَّكِلُوا إِذَنْ يَتَّكِلُوا Then they will rely on this hadith too much. Meaning they'll go off making sins because they don't understand what this word la ilaha illallah means. For listen to the following hadith. He said, يَا مُعَاذ to Mu'adh ibn Jabbar رضي الله عنه مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صِدْقًا مِنْ قَلْبِهِ إِلَّا حَرَّمَهُ اللَّهِ إِلَّا حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ النَّارِ فَيَسْتَبْشِرُوا قَالَ إِذَنْ يَتَّكِلُوا The Prophet ﷺ said, O Mu'ad ibn Jabal, no one who witnesses that there is no God but Allah and that I am Allah's messenger, truthfully from his heart, except Allah has made him unlawful for the fire. Mu'ad ﷺ said, O messenger of Allah, shall I not tell the people so that they will be glad? He replied, if you do, they will rely on it and leave everything else. They're read it by Muslim and Ahmad and Al-Bayhaqi from Anas. Muslim says... Mu'ad narrated it at the time of his death to avoid sinning by keeping it to himself. My brothers and sisters in Islam, there are great scholars and predecessors who speak about this. And some of them who said, the key to paradise is la ilaha illallah. But every key has teeth. So there are conditions to entering it. Rasul is saying here, sidqan, honestly, and what does the word honestly mean when you say la ilaha illallah? That is the secret. That is the point. La ilaha illallah sidqan khalisan min qalbi, Sincerely from his heart. How can a person be sincere? There is only one God worthy of being worshipped and they don't worship him. They don't pray to him. They don't remember him. They go off and they disobey him left, right and center. They take his warnings. In, in the Qur'an, in the hadith, about zina, about alcohol, about theft, about backbone, they take it for granted. And they say, so long as I say, la ilaha illallah, this person is deceived. He, he or she does not know what la ilaha illallah means at all. La ilaha illallah is a pledge of allegiance to Allah, a loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have promised Allah something. You are saying, I will worship you, my Lord. And when I do sins, I will repent to you. person who doesn't do that, they have not fulfilled la ilaha illallah. They have not said it. Sincerely from their heart. So the meaning, even if they commit theft and adultery, meaning that they repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't just take it for granted like that. Now we move on to the descriptions of Jannah. This is the most beautiful part of this whole series. And I would like to begin just with an introduction to the eight doors of Jannah. There are, as the Prophet ﷺ explained to us, there are eight doors to Jannah. And Allah describes in the Quran that there are also eight doors to Jannah. We've mentioned it in classes before. In Al Bukhari, in the chapter of fasting, it names four particular doors. And these doors' names are Babu Salah, the door of prayer, Salat. Another door is called Babu Jihad, the door of striving and, and striving and struggling with your might and blood 
and property in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is also a door called Babu Rayyan, the door of Rayyan. And Ray, the origin of the word Ray, is abundance of provision. You call rain as abundance as well, Ray. So the abundance of provision, such as rain, they still use it for rain and water. And this door is for the people who fast, the fasting people, people who fast Ramadan and voluntary fasting before and after. Ray, the quencher. So Rayyan, many quenches for those who fast and keep themselves away from food and water during prescribed times. Number four, Bab al-Sadaqah or Bab al-Sadaqat, the door of charity. Those who give in charity voluntarily, other than the zakat. So Bab al-Salat, the door of, of prayers, are the ones who do their five daily prayers, including the voluntary prayers, the sunnahs and the nawafil and the night prayers. Bab al-Jihad, fi sabilillah, in your might, in your blood, in your wealth, in your struggle. This is the door for the people of jihad. Babu al-Rayyan of the fasting, Babu al-Sadaqat, voluntary charity. In other hadiths, in other hadiths, different sources and versions, there are also Babu al-Iman, the door of Iman. It's called al-Iman. These are for the people who will enter it without any judgment or accountability on the day of judgment. Also Babu al-Kaadhimin al-Ghayd, wal-Aafina an nas the door of those who restrain their anger and pardon people, forgive people for their mistakes. There's also Babu al-Radiyin. These are the people who are satisfied with Allah had given them in this life and they don't, they don't grovel over the world and, it's, you know, and fight for it and get jealous over it and, and compete for it. And there's also Babu al-Tawbah, the door of repentance. This door of repentance is open all the time. All the time. Rasul Sallam told us that Allah's mercy and His door of repentance is open all the time. As far as it is. And the doors of Jannah are huge. Between each door to the other, there are narrations that speak about 500 years distance from, not from door to door, from the width of the door. The doors are beyond our understanding and imagination, they are beautiful. They are full of light, they are full of gold, they are full of jewelry, they are full of beyond what we could imagine. And Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the one who interpreted or described, explained al-Bukhari, has recorded the possibility that those doors are found inside paradise after entering the main gate. So there's a main gate and there is an angel who is standing, a gatekeeper. His name is Ridwan. Rasul told us, Ridwan is the gatekeeper of Jannah. So maybe there is a gate which everyone enters, and then you are entered through the doors that you are most deserving of. When we spoke about Rasul saying that there will be people who will be called to enter from any door they wish. And among them was a woman who came to the Prophet, was Abu Bakr radiallahu and a woman who came to the Prophet saying, Ya Rasulallah, I have a complaint. Men have been ordered to do jihad and to go out of their homes to strive and struggle. Whereas women, we are, jihad has not been written upon us, as in fighting. So, what do we do? Rasul Sallallahu said, go back to the women and tell them this. Any woman who obeys her Lord, fasts her month, prays her prayers, and obeys her husband, except in that which Allah has forbidden, or she is unable to do, then she will be called on the day of judgment to enter through any door she wishes of the doors of paradise. Does not mean that women can't participate in battles, fi sabilillah, in protection, defense of Muslims and the oppressed. For there are many narrations, such as, which I didn't, I could have talked about them last week, such as Nusayba radiallahu anha, who fought in the battle of Uhud, and Prophet would say, I'd look to my right and I'd look to my left, and there was Nusayba the woman companion. She was there defending the Prophet ﷺ with her body and with her sword. Yes, they fought. They fought vigorously, some women. So they are allowed. However, it was written an obligation upon men before the women. The doors in Jannah are from jewels, as I said, and they have door knockers, as I said, with angels that attend the doors. From one door to the next door is the same as the rider of a running horse going for 500 years before he will stop to reach the next door. And the distance of these doors 
is 500 years in which Rasul Sallallahu says there will come a time in the hereafter where these doors will be jam-packed. Jam-packed. This tells us from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the generosity how many people He will admit into paradise. And when He says jam-packed, it doesn't mean in a negative sense that everybody will be push, shoving and pushing. No, no, no. In other words, it is to describe that even though these doors are so wide, that the people will be waiting in large amounts to enter one after the other. And there will be not enough room for everyone to enter all at once. It's out of the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today, inshallah, I will explain to you at the doors how this entrance will be. And the welcoming as soon as they enter. The first welcoming of the believers in Jannah. And I start first of all with a hadith by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said The first group of people to enter Jannah will be shining like the moon on a full moon night. Then will come those who follow them who will be like the most shining planet in the sky. They will not stand in need of urinating or relieving of nature or of spitting or blowing their noses in Jannah. Their cones will be of gold and their sweat will smell like musk. In there, there will be great provision. Their wives will be large-eyed maidens. All men will be alike in the form of their father, Adam alayhi salam, 60 cubits tall. We already mentioned about women in paradise last time, in brief, and what they will have, and why most hadiths and ayat talk about the women's features more than what they talk about the man's features. In another hadith, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu and Abu Huray radiallahu anhu say that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, when the dwellers of Jannah enter Jannah, an announcer will call. You have a promise from Allah that you will live therein and you will never die. You will stay healthy therein, and you will never fall ill. You will stay young, and you will never become old. You will be under a constant bliss, and you will never feel miserable. Narrated by Muslim, or collected by Sahih Muslim. So as soon as the people enter, this is the first news that they hear. One after the other, this is, this is, the, this is the call. Someone is saying, Allahu A'lam, if it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the angels, the hadith doesn't mention, but a caller will say these words to you. So this welcoming with this glad hope and this enormous beauty of words will enter our ears, bi-idhnillahi, and ask Allah for Jannah, will enter the ears of the people who enter it, saying to them, you're going to live forever, you will never be miserable. So these beautiful words are said to you. They'll also be singing in paradise. So we'll talk about that inshallah later classes to come. And now I would like to explain in more detail. In Muslim and similar hadith in Bukhari. There is a hadith from which I will begin from, and then we will begin our journey. As if, imagining now, as if we are on a storytelling. From the moment we enter, and as you are entering, and striving, uh, and, and walking through Jannah, and seeing, and meeting, and socializing, and so on and so forth. Thawban radiallahu anhu, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I was sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when a Jewish scholar, min ahbar al-Yahud, he said, from the Jewish scholars, came and said, Assalamu alayka ya Muhammad. Peace be upon you, O Muhammad. The companion says, so I pushed him aggressively. In the hadith, in Arabic, he says, I pushed him so hard, that I was almost about to make him, you know, lose his consciousness or lose his life. A very hard push. And the Jewish scholar asked, why did you push me? And I replied, you should say, Ya Rasulallah, O Messenger of God. Why are you saying Muhammad by his name? Say, Ya Rasulallah. Obviously that companion did the wrong thing. And the Jew said, we call him by his name which his family named him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, It is true. My name is Muhammad, which my family named me with. 
In other words, telling the companion, you have no right to push him. My name is Muhammad, my family named with. Let's not, we should not oblige these people, Jews, to address me as the messenger of God when they do not believe so. The Jew said, I came to ask you questions. And the Prophet ﷺ asked, Will it benefit you in any way if I speak to you? And he replied, Well, I will listen with my own ears and be a witness. The Prophet ﷺ, he had a stick in his hand and he poked the stick into the earth and then he looked up at the Jew and said, Sell, ask. And the Jew asked his first question. Where will people be when the earth and the sky cha are changed from their current state? Because the Jews, they believe that. And the Prophet ﷺ replied, In a darkness before the Sirat. The Jewish man then asked, So are the first, so who are the first to cross it? The Sirat, the bridge bestowed above Hellfire. The Prophet ﷺ replied, the first to cross it will be the people, the poor people among the migrants. Al Fuqara Mina Al Muhajirin. Then he asked, What will be their welcoming what will be their welcoming entree? What will be their welcoming entree? In the Arabic he says, Famada Tuhfatuhum Tuhfatuhum. In the Arabic language a tuhfa is a kind of spoiling that you do to your guests when they come to you when they enter. So he's saying, what will be their welcoming entree? As if he's talking about food. What will be their spoil as guests when they first enter paradise? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, it will be an entree of food. Entree of meat of whales, meat from whales of the most tender finger-sized pieces of their meat. And he mentioned وسلم, from the whale's liver. So there is a piece of meat finger size, well, to, in this world, that extends from the liver of the whale, fish, fish meat. And it will be used like an entree for some of the people that enter paradise. In Al-Bukhari it says that this piece of meat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala serves to the people who enter paradise as an entree from fish, from the whale, it is enough to feed 70,000 people. You might be thinking, what is this particular? Well, it's a very rare piece of meat. An exquisite meal. You can't really find it here. You can go to the most expensive restaurants. You cannot find this piece of meat. It extends from the liver. It's very rare. and Obviously, the whales are endangered. And this is something explaining to a, a person in, in, in the desert of the Arabian land something that they could only just hear of and imagine. And the word, I want to repeat that word, tuhfa. In the hadith says, what is their tuhfa? What is their entree or their welcoming, their first welcoming spoil? The Arabs used to refer to entree of food appetizers, such as special fruits and finger foods. When you say tuhfa, they're food appetizers. You eat them first before the main meal. And it is an act of making the guests feel comfortable and spoilt in your welcoming and your generosity. It's like a gesture of welcoming and generosity. So imagine you come, you welcome your guest for you know, lunch or dinner, and before that you give them little entrees, finger foods, bit of fruit, bit of whatever, right? Appetizers. Imagine now what the appetizers will be in Jannah. Allahu Akbar. The man said, the Jewish man, so what will be their main meal then? If that's the entree, what is their ghidha, their main meal? The Prophet ﷺ said, A buffalo, male cow, will, will be slaughtered for them in Jannah. And this particular buffalo in Jannah, it, it used to graze from the tender edges of the grasses of paradise. It's a well, and it's organic food, organic, so in other words, beef. And not just of the cow, of the female cows, because there are a lot of them, but the buffalo cow, which... Also, in those days, if you were a farmer, you would understand, you know, a buffalo is something that you never kill. Whereas in Jannah, there's no problem in that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, it's not just any buffalo. It is a buffalo, its meat has been nourished from the most tender edges. You know, when they use turaf, 
farmers know this when they graze their goats or their, 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 their cows or whatever, they choose the most beautiful grass, the most tender, the most perfect grass. Allah and Rasul is telling us, in other words, from the most best, the most best of the grass of Jannah, this buffalo has been nourished from all this time. And this will be slaughtered for them, and you will eat that. So, the Jewish scholar said, Okay, what will be their drink with the beef then? So they're eating now. What will be their drink? What are they going to drink with it? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, It is a drink from a fountain in Jannah called Salsabil. And, he, and, and in another hadith, or in the ayah in the Quran, it's, you, the word ka's is used. Ka's means a glass of wine, a glass of wine from the river of Salsabil. The word Salsabil, easy flowing, well, beautifully tasting. It is a fountain that Allah had created with paradise called Salsabil. We'll get back to that inshallah shortly. The Jewish scholar then said to the Prophet ﷺ, Sadaqt, you have spoken the truth. And the Jew repeated the whole hadith to confirm it that he also believes in it. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled until his gums showed when he said, Do you want me to tell you what you will be fed in Jannah? In, in Bukhari, it says it that way. Do you want me to tell you what you will be fed? Now this is just the first bit of welcoming when you enter it you're welcome you're welcomed with a feast and beautiful words and an entree and a wine of drink so basically fish and beef is your main meal extra to that a glass of wine from the fountain of Salsabil and an entree of appetizers and fruits from Jannah now brothers and sisters you know you can go to restaurants and you can say I'd like to have this particular meal and they ask, do you want beef or chicken or what do you want, right? Now, you can have a hundred restaurants serving beef. But obviously, some restaurants serve the beef in a different taste to another restaurant. And you will pay, some people pay hundred folds for the beef from this particular restaurant than eating from any other restaurant. Why? Because the way they prepare the beef or the way they prepare the fish is something extraordinary. So imagine in Jannah, who is cooking for you in Jannah? Is it the angels? Are they special cooks which Allah subhanahu wa has created with this special ability? These are real master chefs we're talking about here in Jannah. Forget about all the chefs you've ever known in this world. These are chefs who have been created by Allah with that special talent of making food. These are the ones who will cook for you. Are they angels? Are they beings which Allah, creatures, Allah created them in Jannah that look like humans, but beyond your... What are they? The point is Allah has created people there, people of Jannah, that have been created only to be cooks. And they are happy and smiling and beautiful in there. They serve you with that meal. Now, my brothers and sisters in Islam, having said this, there is so much detail in what I just said. In the next three classes to come, we will only be speaking about this hadith. <laughs> Would you believe it? Who will serve you? How will you be served? When will you be served? What about your wife and husband in Jannah? What about your palaces? Where will you eat this? Who will be serving you? How, what will it taste like? How will this drink be? What it, has Allah said about it? What about the sightseeing? What if I want to go and see things? What if I want to rush to my palace? I'm not hungry. I don't want to eat yet. I don't want to drink yet. What if I want to do something else? So we're going to talk about all these things. You've entered paradise and you've seen things that your eyes never seen. You'll be too busy looking. You'll be too busy sightseeing. You'll be too busy wishing before the food even comes. And when it comes, you forget your wishes. And when you see something else, you forget what was before. Jannah and its dimensions and its reality... We cannot understand it because Allah has created it in a physical world where there are dimensions and physics that we have learnt. You know, such as north, south, east, west, physics, a triangle has three corners. A triangle has three, you know, um, sides. In Jannah, is it the same? What are the dimensions? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows its dimensions. It's not like this world. So therefore you will find, inshallah, next classes to come, descriptions of things that your mind cannot come to terms with. For example, rooms, bedrooms that you have. You can see the outside from the inside. You can see the inside from the outside. But at the same time, they seclude you. 
What does that mean? How can you comprehend that? This is a reality which only be known in paradise. Are they invisible? Are they glass? What are they? So only reality is only known in Jannah. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, there are actually three stages shown in Surat Ad-Dahr in relation to this entrance. The first stage is the stage of what I would like to call a refreshment, a welcoming refreshment. The second stage, the preparation for the feast. The third stage of this welcoming is the feast itself. And then, inshallah, we'll continue what comes after that. But this is just the welcoming when you enter, inshallah ta'ala. So we begin with the first stage. And this happens at the gates of paradise, at the door. And Allahu A'lam, probably just before entering the paradise, you will be served with a, a type of coolness and a refreshment after the terrible events of the Day of Judgment. You've gone through the events now. What do you want right now? You want to be refreshed and cooled down. Isn't that right? Ah, after nervousness. Imagine yourself here after nervousness, after you've just, your, lip, your lips are dry, your throat is dry. What do you want in this world? You say, give me something to drink, man, just to relieve myself. Give me to relax. So the first thing Allah does for you after the Day of Judgment is a type of coolness and a refreshment. But just before that, just before that coolness and refreshment, those who are destined to paradise, you are now, you received your book in the right and you're about to go there. Ar Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wants to meet you. So he calls you, and we mentioned this in classes before. Because of the effect of the wudu you used to make and the prayers that you used to make, there will be nur emanating from the parts of your body that the water reached. So Ar Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will recognize you and he'll be waiting for you at the fountain of Kawthar. Before you reach the gates. And he will, some of you, Al Rasul Azam will give you with his hand to drink from cups of gold and silver in this kawthar. The river was given especially to Prophet. ﷺ. Its taste is nicer, sweeter than the honey. Its look is whiter than the milk. And he will give you, or the angels will give you, or you will give yourself a drink of that particular river. After it, you will never, ever go thirsty again. When we say thirsty, what do we mean by thirst? Like some people might say, but brother, you know when I'm thirsty and I drink, I love that water when I'm thirsty. No, 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 not like that. The pleasure of water and the pleasure of the drink remains. But the discomfort of thirst is not there. Only the pleasure stays. The dry lips, the dry throat, the, the you know, becoming lethargic and all that stuff. It, it doesn't exist. Only the pleasure, only the pleasure. So you will never be thirsty in a negative way ever again. So now that's the first thing. You receive that from the kawthar. What happens next? At the doors of paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in Surah Al-Dahr in verses 5 to 6. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna al-abrar yashrabun min ka'sin kana mizajuha kafura which means, but the righteous will drink from a cup of wine, sweetened with camphor, drawn from an ever-flowing fountain where the servants of Allah drink. So at that door, you are served with cups of wine, from a special fountain in Jannah that is mixed with a fragrance, an essence of kafur, camphor. Literally, it is camphor. Camphor is a fountain in the realms of bliss in Jannah. It is a seasoning added to the cup of pure, beautific wine, as Allah describes. It is cool and refreshing, used as soothing tonic in Eastern medicine in this world today. And in minute amounts, it creates a beautiful odor and a lovable flavor. So this is added to the wine that you receive just before your entrance to cool you down and to refresh your body. Note, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, as I said before, this particular drink is after the drink from the blessed hands of our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa of al-Kawthar, which you will never be thirsty after it ever again. So now you enter through the doors that you are most deserving of entering from. 
If you are a person who used to make your salat, voluntary prayers, in the night, and used to fast voluntary, used to give in charity, you will have the choice of three gates. You may want to enter through a gate and then decide one day to go out and try the other gate. Then try a third gate. Each gate has something in store that the other gate does not have. Depending on how much you work in this world, you will enter through these gates and take from the property that's behind that gate. For every gate has something different to another. But now you enter the gate. Let's say you enter the gate of Salat. What happens? The first surprise, the first surprise is the angels of Allah. They will, come in from, they will come in from different gates and different doors. You will see them coming to you to welcome you. And they will come with smiling faces and welcoming words. And Allah describes this in the Quran where He says in Surah 13 verse 23, Gardens of perpetual bliss, they shall enter there, the Muslims, they shall enter there, as well as the righteous among their fathers, their spouses and their offspring meaning your fathers in this world, your children of this world, and your spouses in this world, if they die in righteousness. You will meet them as you enter the gates. If you go to the higher places, suddenly Allah will let them come to you. You'll meet them. Because no one in the higher places in Jannah, no one in Jannah will be taken down to the lower parts. You'll rise, you will not come lower. And then Allah says in the same verse, and angels shall enter onto them from every gate. يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابِ Angels will enter onto them from every gate and they will say, Peace be upon you for what you persevered in patience. سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا صَبَرْتُمْ فَنِعْمَ عُقْبَ الدَّارِ And they will say to you, Now, how excellent is this final home? This is what the angels will say to you. So imagine now, you've entered the gates. And these angels are coming from different doors. He said, what are these doors? Beautiful doors, gates opening up. And beautiful angels of light with wings. They come to you, just to you. You are to welcome you, to look at you, to meet you. And they come with a smile saying, peace be upon you, for you have strived and struggled in patience. Now look at this. Isn't this a beautiful home to be your final abode? That's what they will say to you. Now obviously... As you enter, you see things that your eye has never seen, you hear things your ear has never heard, and no heart has ever imagined. So now, you are taken away by this beauty. And you just want to look and go for sightseeing. You want to see. You want to, you know, where are you going to start? Where are you going to start? And these words are coming to you. You'll live here forever. Where are you going to start? Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said, that the messenger, this is in Bukhari and Muslim, that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, describing the value of what you see in there. He says, a space in Jannah, a space in Jannah, equal to the distance between the middle and end of a bow. Now obviously these people, they knew what bow and arrows mean. Of a bow, because everybody had a bow. So if you've ever seen a bow and arrow, he is saying, any space in Jannah, the distance between the middle and the end of a bow will be better than all that upon which the sun has ever risen or set upon. The palm's length or the, the, the length of a bow and arrow of space in Jannah is better than whatever the sun has ever risen or set upon. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his pinky finger in the ocean one time and he lifted it and he said, do you see how much of the water is still on my finger? They said, yes. He said, the comparison of this world to the hereafter is like the comparison of what stayed on my pinky finger compared to the rest of this ocean. There is nothing compared to it. And so you look at this Jannah and you see soil beneath your feet, grass beneath your feet, but it's not like the grass that you've seen, not like the soil. You see pebbles and stones that you walk on. You know when you walk outside, now, outside this masjid, just go have a walk on the footpath. You'll find pebbles on the street, right? Find pebbles on the footpath, pebbles here. Does anyone care for those pebbles? They're everywhere, right? Soil everywhere, little rocks here and there. Well, these little rocks and these little pebbles and these little soils in Jannah 
What are they? Rasul Sallallahu describes in Allah, he says, وَحَصْبَاؤُهَا اللُّؤْلُؤُ وَالْيَاقُوتِ These insignificant pebbles and rocks on earth that everyone walks on in Jannah, they are pearls and rubies. As the, if that's the most insignificant thing in Jannah. It's for everybody. You walk on them. And its soil is of musk. You grab it like that and you say, wow, this looks like rare soil. But then you realize that this is actually everywhere. This is the soil of Jannah. You don't have to go to far distances. You know, like that movie, uh, Blood Diamond. Diamond Blood, is that what it's called? Right? How diamonds, they kill each other and they chop each other's hands off. For, for you don't have to, in Jannah, it's just, this, is, this is nothing. This is, just, this is just the most insignificant thing. Like any soil here. SubhanAllah. In this world, if sand of beach can benefit, they would have charged you for it. No one could touch it. However, in Jannah, all of this, the sand in Jannah is pearls and rubies. And the grass of Jannah is being described by the Prophet ﷺ as za'faran, saffron. So there is grass in Jannah of saffron. And the grasses are of many types. You know, here in this world, you look at a grass and say, it's grass. What type of grass? So you know what grass is, but grass is different to other grass, yes? So in Jannah there is grass, but each grass is different to other grass. And it's not like the grass of this world. Now if this is what's abundant, what is Jannah? Therefore Jannah is described as greenery, fountains, rivers, mountains, valleys of beauty, animals and fruits and trees of beyond our imagination. A brother asked me one day, he said, what? So we live only in greenery? What about beaches? I want sand and beach. I want sand and I want to fish. So of course you can fish. Of course you can, you can see beaches there. How about even better than that? You can wish for your own beach. And you can wish for the way you want your beach to be. How's that? And you can wish for the type of fish that are going to be in there. Because Allah says, and we'll narrate inshallah in the next classes the authentic hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when the mu'min enters paradise, when you get to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is later on, I'm going to leave this to the end, He will say to the believer, and each person on his own, individually, by yourself. All, and at the same time by yourself. Abdi tamanna, my servant wish. Wish, wish forever you have anything you want. Tamanna abdi, wish for more, wish for more. Until you run out of wishes. And then Allah gives you ideas. What about this, what about that? So imagine, don't ask these questions. Do I get a beach over there and it's not mentioned in the hadith? Allah has already explained it. You have whatever you wish. You can wish for your own little earth if you want. Huh? Imagine that.